<laughs> Absolutely. So it's good to be here this morning. Thank you uh, for inviting me. This actually came out of, um, we had, we've just celebrated 15 years of the Cap Debt Centre in the local area. And I just shared a bit of my testimony. John said, you need to come to Saltisford um, to come and share your testimony. So I think it was um, God's strategic way in. Okay. Um, so I've got a, a message for you. And I'm just going to pray before I start. Um, Father in heaven, I want to thank you and praise you for you. Just for you. Jesus, I want to thank you for your beautiful face. That we are invited to come into the throne room with boldness and confidence as sons and daughters of God. We just sung um, that we are sons. That means all of us. We're all called sons of God in this place today. And Holy Spirit, I want to ask you to help me to empty myself out of anything that's of me this morning so that you would have your way in this place, in your people, to give your word and your message that would leave their hearts Hungry for more of you and hungry for what it is that you want to do with them in this church, in this season, and in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I always like God to confirm his word. I would have liked to come this morning with a bunch of um, snowdrops, you know, a nice smelly sermon with a sweet smelling aroma. But I believe that God wants to challenge you all this morning. Um, and I believe the last song that we sung about, about the humble person of God really ties into the message that I want to bring to you this morning. So we are in a new season here at Saltus for Church, and I only get to come here this morning. I have taken my cap hat off, by the way. So if anything I say today offends you, it wasn't Darren as Catman, it was Darren as your visiting speaker, and you might not ask me to come back again, okay? But I don't mind, but as long as God gets his message. Um, so I'm going to start off this morning. I mean, Daniel, we're going to go on to, um, but I'm going to lay the foundation with something slightly different, okay? <laughs> Um, so, I'm going to talk about Genesis to start off with, because everything started in Genesis. Um, and I'm just going to briefly, I'm going to read through this briefly, um, so, so I'm not expecting you to go through all of this yourself, um, because we're going to spend a lot of the time in Daniel 1, verses 1 to 21. But Genesis 3, um, we can read in Genesis 3, um, it says this, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God made, and he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, God said, You shall not eat it, nor, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in that day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree desirable to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate it. She gave also to her husband with her and he ate it. Okay, so we read in Genesis 3, that Adam took, Adam and his wife took the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, opening up themselves to three things. The pride of life, which was introduced to them by Satan. They then opened themselves up to the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh. It happened in a place of abundant beauty and provision. Eden was a place of plenty. It lacked nothing, but it had everything. It was lush. It was green, it was abundant in fruit, veg, herbs, seeds, animals, and all other living creatures. Father God walked with Adam and his wife in the cool of the day in a face-to-face -face relationship. Up until the point of sin entering in, it was a place of untouched perfection and majestic wonder of God's creation. It was the icing on the cake of his creative masterpiece because it included man, the first son of Adam and his wife. But it became defiled by Adam and his wife's deception. We're now going to go forward several thousand years um, to Jesus being in the desert um, to Matthew 4. Okay, So I'm going to just briefly read from Matthew 4. If I can find it, here we go. Um, 
Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. I bet he was. Um, now, when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stone, stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into the holy city and set him on the high pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give you angels charge over you, and in your hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone." Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and only him you shall serve. Then the devil left him and Behold, angels came and ministered to him. So, we've just seen the pride of life, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes come in through Adam and his wife in the Garden of Eden. Now in Matthew 4, we read how the only begotten Son of God, how he dealt with the enemy and destroyed the works of Satan. So through Adam and his wife, the sin of the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes came into the world. Here we have Jesus destroying it. But why did Jesus choose to do that in the desert? We know that Satan took him out of the desert and placed him on a high pinnacle and on a mountain. It's extraordinary that Jesus actually chose to go with him. But why? The only sin that entered the heart of Lucifer that led all other sins was pride. It was pride within him that, that took him, that led Jesus onto the mountain and the pinnacle. Satan said, if you bow down and worship me, I will. If you jump off here, if you turn that stone into bread, etc. God is the opposite to Satan. Where Lucifer became proud, Jesus became humble. Jesus could have called on countless legions of angels to come and destroy Satan in the desert. Instead, he left heaven, he came to earth as God, but still fully man, to eventually find himself stripped of any honour, exaltation or knowledge of him being the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. He found himself in a barren, desolate place of a desert, surrounded by sand, wind, the hot baking sun of the daytime, and the cold chill of the night. Why? Because where Lucifer used pride to bring sin into the world, Jesus became humble in his ways to destroy the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes. They are the three sins that Jesus dealt with in Matthew 4. Jesus destroyed all the works of the enemy in the desert. So where Satan used pride, Jesus used humility. For all of us, Humility is our greatest weapon to destroy the works of Satan. Why? There's a lot of whys going on here. Um, because when we acknowledge our weaknesses and our constant need for God's strength, humility is our key for unity. Pride will cause disunity in a person, in relationships and in a church. A haughty head will cause much strife, but a humble heart will bring much life. So what does this have to do with Daniel, and how does it apply to Saltersford in this season? Shall we go on to Daniel? Okay. So, Daniel, Daniel, Daniel. Da I don't believe for one moment that you are just reading the book of Daniel. Prophetically, we are in, people say we're in a Daniel season, aren't we? We've all, always been in a sort of Daniel season where God promises that he'll pour out his spirit on all flesh, upon his maid servants, on his manservants, that we will have visions and we will have dreams. And here we have Daniel himself being a man who could interpret dreams and wisdom. Um, and 
I believe today that actually God wants to impart to you today some wisdom. So I'm going to carry on um, with what I believe the Lord wants me to share. Um, so here we have King Joachim, who chose to rule and reign over Judah his way, not God's way. The consequence of his actions meant that he lost everything that God had given him. He came under the ruling authority of an oppressor, a dictator, and one who was steeped in idolatry. So here we have the starting point that unites the word that I've just shared um, earlier before Neil sort of um, spoke the word. Um, both Joachim and Nebuchadnezzar were both filled with pride. They were not filled with the Holy Spirit. And although we're speaking about a time when the Holy Spirit mainly came in visitations or through an anointing, we know that the Holy Spirit still inhabited some men and women in the Old Testament. David himself cries out in Psalm 51, Do not take your Holy Spirit from me, which suggests that the Holy Spirit lived in him because he was anointed by God as king, and he also kept an ongoing relationship with God. As we read through the Psalms, there's so many illustrations of David being in relationship with God, which is amazing. Again, pride caused King Nebuchadnezzar to want to change the names and identities of the sons of God the people of Israel. King Nebuchadnezzar was not a Christian. We know that this is pre-Christ, um, but he was the absolute opposite of a Christian. He was a bloodthirsty dictator, an empire builder, a conqueror of people and nations. He was being ruled by Satan, but in amid his kingdom, under the oppressive leadership, God gave these four men favor. But why? Because amid a land where people deny God, and his ways, these four men stuck fast to the truth and they chose to honor him through the challenges, the turmoil, and the ever changing landscape in which they were living. Does this sound familiar um, if we compare it to the world in which we live in today? The Spirit of God was on them and moving through them. Why? Because Daniel and his friends humbled themselves before God. They knew that they had to become weak so that he could become strong. King Joachim shows us that if we dishonor God, his word and his ways, then he will take us from that which he has entrusted to us and he will take things away from us. His judgment will come upon us and we will reap the consequences of our actions. Now you might be thinking, Darren, but what about God's grace, redemption? What about his forgiveness and our salvation? Of course, we're all saved. Of course, we're all children of God. But none of this means that we live how we want to live. It's only when we are filled with the Holy Spirit that we can be led and keep in step with the Spirit. It's only when we are filled with the Holy Spirit that we can know fully how God thinks and what his ways are for us. It's only when we're filled with the Holy Spirit that we can know when we need to repent because we have fallen short and gone our own way and done our own thing. I mean, I'd like to give a, a little analogy um, at this point in the moment. So the Bible says, as far as the east is from the west, are our transgressions removed from him? Isn't that amazing? I mean, have you tried to walk west and east at the same time? It's impossible, isn't it? So isn't that amazing? And why is that? Because we are in Jesus Christ. And the Father can only see us as he sees his son Jesus. So if the Father can only see us as he sees his son Jesus, he can only ever see the best version of you. The Holy Spirit gets to live inside of us and he gets the role to convict us of our sin, of the things that we do wrong, because the Holy Spirit can only see the best version of us. And he wants to live from that place of best version. But we're not perfect, are we? And the truth is we are being perfectly loved by a perfect God, but we are imperfect and we are able to make lots of mistakes. So, the name Daniel, what does it mean? Daniel means God is my judge. And I'm not saying this morning that God is here to judge you, um, but God is here to align you with what it is that he wants to do with you this morning. Through the testimony of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, we can see that God blesses those who honor him. He gave them strength when they chose to become weak. He gave them favor in a foreign land before a king who was not worshiping their God. 
He gave them favor over the ruling powers and authorities. And because they chose to listen to the voice of God, they received his strategic wisdom to win the spiritual battle and to break through the warfare that surrounded them. Why? Because Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. He chose to keep himself pure. God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill Goodwill, goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs, Ashpenaz. Daniel gave the word of wisdom to the steward of the chiefs of the eunuchs to test the four men for ten days. But let's remind ourselves that this was not just a ten-day fast or a lifestyle change, but this would have continued for around three years. This would have happened until the king called them into his presence to be interviewed after a time of learning the language and the literature of the Chaldeans. After three years of humbling themselves by eating nothing but vegetables and water, they were allowed to speak the words of wisdom God had given them. It broke through the darkness. It created light where King Nebuchadnezzar could only see the glory of God compared to the dark words and actions that would have come from his magicians, astrologers, and sorcerers. Why? Because whatever the cost may have been, they chose to honor God. They chose to put him first and to surrender all their ways. They chose humility over pride. Now, through this word, is God trying to say within for Church, some of you are filled with pride. I've got to be very careful where I go from here, hey? Um, I don't believe that as Christians, any of us want to intentionally become proud. But we are subject to it. If the holiest man and woman that ever lived in the Garden of Eden, that walked day to day, face to face with their God, were able to open their hearts up to pride, to the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, then so have we and so do we. Me, my wife, my children, my grandchildren. I know I look too young to have grandchildren, don't I? Not really. We all open ourselves up to the pride of the enemy. There's no better example than this than to go into the Bible. Okay, so Matthew 18. At the time when the disciples um, came to Jesus um, and asked, who will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Is that humility? I mean, what were, I mean, I don't know, I wasn't there, and nor were you, but what was going on? I mean, had the disciples come back together after being out uh, around the area, you know, healing the sick, raising the dead, and did somebody like, you know, Thomas come and said, I've just raised seven people from the dead this morning, and then maybe Peter said, wow, you know, I've just seen 60 family members baptized, all this is going on, and one of them might have said, you know, but who will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? I said, I know, let's ask Jesus. Who will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, often when you ask Jesus a question, he doesn't give you a yes or no answer, does he? He responds quite differently. He called a little child and he had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth. Unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, who humbles himself like this little child, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. I would imagine the disciples would have stopped in their tracks and thought, oh dear, we've got it wrong again. And then we have Peter, dear Peter, in Matthew 16, when Jesus said to him, but what about you? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter's answer said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, son of Jonah. For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you, Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And I will give you the keys of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. And then, only seven verses later, this is what happens. From this time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter 
As we know these famous words, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have the mind of the concerns of God, but merely of human concerns. And then we have Peter again in Matthew 28. Then Jesus told them, this very night you will fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Now you think in that moment, Peter is just, you know, wanting to stand by Jesus. But then Jesus helps him out a little bit and he says, truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter goes on. Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. It's like, no, there is pride working. Pride stops to, tries to stop the will of God. Okay. So I want to share a short testimony with you about pride. Okay. Um, so I can say that I've been a very proud person in my life. You know, I do things which, you know, I, I'm proud of. But I started to see pride in other people and in the churches. And I wanted to ask God if he would deal with the pride in people. And he said to me, first I want to deal with pride in you. And I thought, that's not God. I haven't heard God say that. I'm not proud. And then I almost hear God, God laughing and saying, <laughs> and for about three months he started to put his finger on almost, I can't say everything, but pride. And every, every voice I heard in my head was the things that my mother used to speak over me. That, that you are no good, you know, you, you're never good. You think that you're something, but you're not, you know. Just, just little, little words like this that used to speak, speak over me, and I would repeat these words. It's like, how dare my kids put their shoes on the floor? Wait till I get hold of them. It's pride. It's not me trying to be a parent. It's pride in my heart. And God has brought me to a place to actually say sorry to him for these things, for pride, for arrogance, for puffing myself up, for actually parading myself that, you know, I am the one in charge when actually not. So actually, as I've gone through this journey, what he started to say to me that through humility, he wants to put his finger on pride elsewhere because he wants it out because where there is humility and not pride, there is unity in a person and in a church. So as I bring this into land, how does this relate to you all here at Saltersford Church? So I don't know you all that well. I hear little things. But the one thing that has stood out to me the most has been about the leadership in this church, has been about the leading of this church. Um, and I know that you had Ian for many, many years, and he's now gone on to other things. Um, but I was just asking God, you know, what is it that you want to say to, to, Saint, to um, I was going to say St. Mary's Church, and this is Solstice for Church, by the way, for those listening. Um, what is it that you want to say? And I'm going to share a word with you, and if this is from God, hopefully it will stick well, and I will also get it across to you by email so you can look at it a little bit better. But both individual and corporate pride will cause independence rather than total dependency on God and his ways, when humility will cause us to yield fully to the person of the Holy Spirit. And again, I'm always looking for confirmation for God's word. You have just finished a season of talking about the fruit of the Spirit, okay? Um, so the Holy Spirit... To yield to the Holy Spirit, the word yield means to submit, succumb, surrender, to bow down, to give in, to cave in, and to humble yourself to the things and the ways of God. I got, I got this next word probably about four or five weeks ago. Since John asked me to speak, I've been praying consistently about what it is that he wants me to bring. Now, Prophecy needs to be tested. It needs to be weighed. Does it line up with the character of God? Does it line up with the Bible? Does it line up with, um, yeah, a number of people around you come into agreement with what you think God, God is saying? Um, and I'm going to share this with you. And here's what I had a sense of God saying. The Spirit of the Lord is calling for seven of you to fast and pray for three days to specifically discern the direction of the church and your need for a leader. God wants to speak to those seven people individually. At the end of those three days, he asks you seven to come together collectively to find the common themes that are running through that which you have heard. The Spirit of the Lord said that there needs to be seven people who are willing to empty themselves out of their agenda, who are ready to hear from God about what he wants for Salters for Church. Following three days of prayer and fasting, God is calling you to spend 
30 days weighing and testing what the Lord has spoken before feeding it back to the main body of the church. During the time of prayer and fasting, the Lord wants you to consistently and continually ask him to speak to you. He wants you to worship him, to be still and to rest in him and to listen to what it is that he wants to say to you. Write down what you hear and remember not to share anything with anyone else until the 30 days are up. God promises to reward those things that are done in secret and kept in secret until the time comes to release his word. Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace, but I came to bring a sword. Jesus said, do not pray for peace upon this earth. Jesus came to reveal his father and we are called to do the same. So, I would like to pray for you this morning. I just want to pray what I believe that God has put on my heart. By all means, come and chat to me about this at the end. Um, I did feel a little bit like Jonah wanted to run in the opposite direction before when I had this word coming together. Um, But this is about the trajectory of this church and where you're going. And I can stand here and believe that actually God is saying to you that you need a leader. You need one person within your group of leaders who will, who will be the one that will make that decision on where you are going and what you are doing. And I asked James this morning, I said to James, how many people are there in your leadership? He said six. And I had a sense of seven people coming together. Because there is one missing in this house that God wants to send. The thing is, that, and I'm, I didn't even plan to say this. By not having a leader in this house, you are denying God having the person in this place that he wants to be to lead you on into the next season. I've just walked down, is this Albert Street here or, or, um, yes. I've walked down here and heard a lady going in the door this morning of her house. And she was in pain, she was struggling. And I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, there's so much pain in this community that I want to heal. And I know that Saltisford, you are good at going into your community. You love people and you have been loving people. But we're in a new season. And I believe that we're in a season of harvest. That there's a harvest coming into this time that we are in right now. And he wants you to be prepared and made ready to go out and get the harvest and bring in the harvest. So it's the person that he's bringing to this house that will lead you into that season. Not just for the harvest, but for you as well. You need to have that one leader. And at that point, I'm going to end what I'm saying. Um, I don't want to overrun or overstay. But I'm going to pray if it's okay with you. Holy Spirit, I want to invite you to come, that you're already here, that you live inside each and every one of us. I want to thank you and praise you, Jesus, that where your word goes forth from your mouth, it will not return void, but it shall accomplish and establish for that it which it was, it was sent, so it will bear fruit for your kingdom. Father, I want to ask that you will draw the seven people that you have chosen, that you would anoint them, Holy Spirit, and make it clear to them and show them exactly how you want them to fast, how you want them to pray. What does that look like from your perspective, Father? So that they can come together collectively to compare the themes that are running through what they've heard and come to the point and decision that you want them to make about the future of this church and leadership in this house. Holy Spirit, I ask you to bless this church with compassion for each other, with a unity that is unseparable, that is not able to be divided by anything or anyone, especially the enemy who tries to rob, kill, and destroy, who prowls around like a roaring lion to those who do have pride in their hearts, Father. We pray for the humility of Christ to rest upon our brothers and sisters. We pray for the humility of our Father to walk in the hearts of these sons and daughters, that you would bring them to a broad place where they will see clearly the future of what you have for them and what it is that you want to do with them and through them. Father, bless this house, bless this land. And even I step, stand in the gap this morning and I say, Father, as your son, Father God, I repent for any pride, I, I, for any self-centeredness in this house this morning. And I ask, Father, that you bring your forgiveness by your spirit, by breathing in, Father God, and blowing away any father got unseen blind independence and doing things their ways and bringing us all into your perspective that we would live from John 5 19 that the sons and daughters would do nothing of themselves but only what they see their father doing because what the father does the sons and daughters will do in a like manner So, Father God, bless your people with visions, with dreams, with insight and revelation through your word and through your spirit alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.